Hello, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough of Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on the neuroscience of persuasion. During the last presidential election, a man took firearms, went into this pizza joint, and demanded to liberate a child sex trafficking ring operated by Hillary Clinton candidate for president, and claimed that the children were being held in the basement of this pizza joint that had no basement. It was obviously fake news, but what convinces a man to believe so deeply that Hillary Clinton would be operating a child sex trafficking ring that he is willing to break the law, take firearms, go into a public location at gunpoint and uh, demand to liberate the kids? We, we can assume that this person is mentally ill, but I think it's more interesting to look at how somebody can become persuaded that something so absurdly false could actually be a plausible uh, scenario. So let's look at an old theory of behavior change. This is social judgment theory. And we'll look at a range of attitudes towards uh, the death penalty or, or to capital punishment for murder. So um, what should the punishment be? Obviously, the first choice there is a little bit absurd. But there's a range of attitudes somebody might have for how somebody should be punished uh, if... Uh, if they've been convicted of murder. Um, and so if we look at a range of potential opinions that people might have, one person uh, in this particular case uh, is going to uh, believe that life without parole or the death penalty are the acceptable punishments for murder. Uh, and that's indicated by what we see as the latitude of acceptance in green. And if somebody were to argue with them that, well, what about life with the possibility of parole and said, you know, hey, people might reform their, their uh, uh, you know, their behavior after, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, the person, this person that I'm showing you here, this notional person might not agree with that, but they would say, well, I can see your point. You're not unreasonable. Uh, and that becomes the latitude of non-commitment. But for this person, if you were to suggest that they get 20 years in prison or less, or on the other side, that they uh, that people should be uh, tortured to death as, as a punishment for murder. Those views are extreme, uh, according to this person, and, and those views would be in the latitude of rejection. And so the people would say that that's not a reasonable view. Well, let's say there's another person who has slightly different opinions. Uh, for this other notional person, uh, they believe that life with the possibility of parole is acceptable. And they could understand why somebody would want to have life without the possibility of parole uh, or a, a you know, shorter prison sentence. But the idea of uh, a trivial fine uh, or the idea of capital punishment is, is considered extreme. So now, let's say the first person, person over here, is trying to convince the person over here to uh, favor the death penalty and, and to change their views. Well, what does that look like? Well, the first, the, the anchor point that this person has is, of course, where their latitude of acceptance is. That's the belief that they currently have. And so conventional wisdom might suggest that you should argue in favor of the death penalty and why all of these reasons are, are just and, and reasonable and, and maybe even, ex, you know, uh, create uh, an extreme point and advocate for death by torture uh, and come up with all the reasons for that to try and, and overshoot and, and move this person's opinion closer to the death penalty. But what we find in psychology is that tactic, when your arguments land in a person's latitude of rejection, has the tendency to move that anchor in the opposite direction. And that's called the boomerang effect. So when we're delivering persuasive messages, uh, not necessarily on a political topic like this, but on a healthcare topic, like should you get screened for breast cancer? Uh, or should you wash your hands to, to prevent disease? Uh, we need to make sure that our arguments are not landing in an audience's latitude of rejection, or we may have unintended consequences and experience the boomerang. Uh, here's an example, not quite as extreme, of uh, smoking cessation. So Emily Falk and colleagues, they uh, took three different public service announcements to call a 1-800-QUIT-NOW uh, quit line for, uh, for smoking cessation. Uh, 
And they showed it to people that were planning to quit smoking and asked their opinions on how effective the ads would be. And so uh, you see in the left graph here, these are the self-reported rankings on how effective they were. Everybody liked ad B, A was okay, and C was kind of like a bit of a stinker. It was, it was kind of okay. Well, then she did something interesting and she measured brain activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. I'll show you where that is in a minute. And she found very different results. And then we actually looked at the call volume of how many people called the 1-800-QUIT-NOW during the airing of each of the three ads. These ads were done in, in different uh, months uh, in the same region. And we find that the call volume actually is correlated pretty well with the neural response to ads and not at all with the self-reported rankings. So how does this work? Well, activation in the medial prefrontal cortex has been associated in a number of studies with self-integration. And that's this area right here in the uh, middle of your forehead, uh, right above uh, your eyes and between them. And activity in this region is highly predictive of behavior change as we saw in the previous graph. And it may or may not be related to self-reported change. Well, uh, there's other key brain regions of interest. We find that when this area in the left, uh, sorry, in the right lateral prefrontal cortex, this, this area is active, that uh, this is associated with counter-arguing. That's that boomerang effect, where your brain gets practiced at rejecting potentially truthful information, and that is negatively correlated, as indicated by the dashed line there, with medial prefrontal cortex activity. So yes, when this area of the brain becomes active, it actually shuts down the part of the brain that would adopt new behavior and new beliefs. Well, uh, we also know that when we use rhetorical persuasion, ethos, pathos, logos, if it is in agreement with what you already believe, it will tend to promote activity in this region of the brain. However, if it is the opposite of what you believe, if it is uh, in the latitude of rejection, it actually invokes counter-arguing, which shuts down your ability to have behavior change. Now there's a couple ways we can disrupt that counter-arguing. If we are able to activate the reward circuit, which is in the ventral uh, striatum, or the occipital frontal uh, cortex, uh, orbital frontal cortex, in these regions right here, uh, then we can shut down the counter-arguing area of the brain, and we can promote this self-integration. The other way we can do that is through narrative immersion, which we see in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, or the temporal parietal junction, uh, to other regions of the brain. When those are active, it also shuts down counter-arguing, promotes self-integration. And we know that when we tell stories and use narrative persuasion, we activate this region of the brain, and that is more an, a more effective method of persuasion. So in, in my research, I actually use a functional near-infrared spectroscopy, and so we equip... Uh, LED lights, very similar to a uh, um, uh, pulse oxygen measure uh, that you would put on your finger in a, in a doctor's office. We place these on the scalp, and we're able to use them to measure brain activity in regions of interest in the prefrontal cortex. So you see a couple of us uh, fixing uh, subjects. We're able to uh, operate the system off of a laptop computer and then show subjects various stimuli and measure their neural response. Uh, the system works because oxygenated and deoxygenated tissue absorb light at different wavelengths. So if we modulate the light at two different wavelengths, we are able to measure the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated tissue. The light is emitted with one LED and then detected with another, and it creates this regular banana-shaped pattern uh, so we can identify where the light is coming from uh, or which uh, you know, light source uh, the light is coming from and, and then measure brain activity within this three centimeter area. Uh, I've used this to study public health ads in Jordan and Egypt. I've also used it to study sectarianism in Iraq among Sunnis and Shias, and also tobacco ads in the United States. Here's an example of one of the uh, tobacco ads. So we looked at uh, 10 different tobacco ads, and we're able to measure activation in this uh, asymmetric difference in the prefrontal cortex, which measures your motivation or engagement versus your disgust, avoidance, and withdrawal. So we're able to kind of see that across this Y axis. 
and then we're able to measure the level of counter-arguing or message resistance along the x-axis. And what we find this in this study is that Marlboro, which are the most recognized tobacco brands according to the, uh, among the population before the study, uh, they were advertising environmentally friendly ads. And so they were appealing, and we had a lot of engagement, but it also indicated high resistance because people didn't believe that the tobacco company was good for the environment. Another brand, Red Sun, as their ad campaign is that they have more nicotine than anything else in the market. And so there's no message resistance or acceptance, but we find that uh, there's a lot of uh, withdrawal and avoidance from that high nicotine content among the population. Organic ads, yes, there's organic cigarettes, uh, tend to have high appeal and uh, a little bit more acceptance. And the most popular ad was from Newport, which showed four teenagers having fun, and we found that there was a high level of acceptance and a high motivation and engagement. And so I would argue that that is the more effective ad to use in that campaign. And the purpose of this is just to show you how taking two neural measurements can give us some indicator as to the effectiveness or lack thereof of something like tobacco ads. Uh, I've also used this for studying how two people uh, interact in relationship with one another. So what you're seeing here is uh, we fit subjects with the, the FNIRs. Uh, the image here in the middle shows two FNIRs devices. So this is what's actually measuring uh, the, the neural patterns. Uh, both of these are connected to one laptop computer. And we took uh, Sunni and Shia. We primed them with either conciliatory or argumentative messaging. And then we had them work on a task together. And we're able to look at similarities in brain waves during the course of the activity. The idea is the more in sync two people are, the more likely they are to form a relationship and collaborate and cooperate. Whereas if they are uh, out of sync, the more likely they are to be in conflict. And so we were able to take a resource allocation task where we asked them to prioritize eight potential programs. A third of them favored Sunnis, a third of them favored Shias, and a third of them were neutral. And so we are then able to ask them to do the same activity together and measure the level of compromise based on uh, how in sync their neural activity uh, was. Um, here's a study that this was based on out of uh, Dartmouth and uh, UCLA, where they took a cohort of individuals and mapped out the social network uh, over a period of an MBA program. And the red nodes indicate people that at the beginning of the program were shown 14 random video ads and their neural patterns were measured over time. And so what we're able to see is that the uh, similarity in brain activity is correlated with social distance. So we find that um, people that had a social distance of three or more, uh, you know, three, were uh, negatively correlated in their neural patterns. And what's interesting with uh, people that had a social distance of four or more, that is statistically zero. And what we know about social networks is you're, you're pretty... Um, aware of who your friends are, and you might know who your friends' friends are, but once you get a more than three degrees of separation through a network, the likelihood of you knowing people in that network more than three degrees removed from you uh, is pretty much zero, right? That approach is zero. So the fact that social distance at four or more is zero indicates that these people have not really had much interaction with each other, and so that's a, a pretty normal finding. Uh, the fact that three degrees of separation are negatively correlated suggests that people that are out of sync in their neural patterns are actually repelling one another and that the people that are more in sync are more likely to be friends. So there's still a lot more work that's being done in this area. I've connect, collected data in two studies uh, and we're still going through the analysis of that data now. So uh, this has been a short lecture on the neuroscience persuasion. I've covered some of the key brain regions and findings that uh, suggest that this is a promising field of research. I've covered some of uh, my research as it's applied to public health and uh, given you some insight into where the future is going with neurosynchrony. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and I hope you get a chance to participate in some neuro studies, neuroscience studies in the near future. Thank you.